Good evening. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you your uh, president uh, for this year, uh, Professor David Warwick. Take it away, David. Thank you, Jonathan. Now, hopefully you can see my screen share. Time management for busy people. Now, why, why is this interesting to us? Well, here we are buzzing around like blue flies doing all that we do. Surgery, academia, private work, all this sort of stuff. And we get too busy, but what we really want to do is this. We want to go out on our bikes with our mates, go fishing with our family, drink beer, keep fit and that sort of thing. And to do this in our busy lives, we have to manage our time effectively. You know, there's loads of books out there. And I've read lots of them and thought about lots of these things. And I suppose there's one book I'd really recommend. It's this, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey. It is a fantastic book. And I thoroughly recommend you get this, preferably as a video. And one of the chapters is Putting First Things First. And Stephen Covey wrote a second book, First Things First, just on that one issue of time management. And this is probably the best time management book you can get your hands on. Another resource is Brian Tracy. He's done some great stuff. And if you look him up on YouTube, well, there are some great time management seminars as well. So for the next 15 or 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about these things. There's a list of different tips and wrinkles that I've picked up over the past to help me get through my busy day, but still have time left to do what life is all about. So first of all, don't waste time. You may have heard of the Pareto Principle, an Italian economist who pointed out that 20% of our input accounts for 80% of the output. And this is true for time management as well. The trouble with us as hand surgeons, we're all a little bit perfectionist and a bit pernickety. But you know, you have to learn that good enough is good enough. And the enemy of good is perfect. And for most things, you need to spend the right amount of time and not too much. Don't waste the time. However, and we all know this, if you don't find the time to do it properly, you will have to find the time to put it right. Two other bugbears, well, lunch is for wimps. And I think we can sometimes spend a bit too much time hanging around at lunch and stuff where you could be doing things. And perhaps sometimes lying in bed for too long uh, is a waste of time when you could get up and do something. The other reason not to waste time or not way not to waste time is concentration. When you've got a task to do, you've got to shut the door, switch off your phone and switch off your email. The worst thing you can do is to have the emails keep coming in and uh, interrupting you. Now, sometimes you do get interrupted and you've got to get rid of people nicely, genuinely and politely. I'm busy right now, but I want to make some time to help you. May I call you back at 6 p.m.? So learn how to deal with interruptions in a way that makes the other person special, but saves you time. Another time saver uh, is Audible. Now Audible's on Amazon, and instead of buying a book that takes weeks and years to read, you can get it on Audible, and you can listen to this when you're driving home from work or waiting for a train or queuing up for an aeroplane. Newspapers, there's no need to buy a big, huge newspaper and wait hours reading through that. You can have this on your phone, uh, on an app and just read the headlines while you're waiting for a lift. And the other app is Blinkist that you may have seen. This is a great app and Blinkist, you subscribe not much money each month and it gives you a constellation of a whole load of books and a book that might be 300 pages long uh, takes less than 10 minutes just to read the key bits. It's a great resource to broaden your knowledge but not spend years doing it. Having a philosophy to save time or to make time, you need to know what it's all about. Health, peace of mind, relationships. It's important to have your own personal philosophy. Now, now Barack Obama, who um, has many strengths, and, and, and what this was his philosophy, be kind, be useful. So when you're spending your time, maybe being kind to others, being useful to others, uh, is a really great way of doing things. George V, the secret of happiness is not to do what you like, but to learn to like what you do. 
you know, we get a bit selfish sometimes. Oh, I hate my fracture clinic. I hate this. I hate that. Me, 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 me. Well, actually, we're privileged to be a profession. We're privileged to be doctors. And I'm afraid that privilege comes with having to do stuff we don't particularly want to do. If you can learn to like doing it, then you'll be spending your time much more happily. Here's another one. This is one of mine. Well, aim as high as you can because you regret it if you don't. But make sure you will still be happy if you land lower than you thought. Uh, one of the definitions of disappointment is that you just aim too high and you allow yourself to go upset if you don't make it. Setting goals is crucial. You need to know what you really want, but also what are you prepared to sacrifice to get these goals? And when you set goals, you have to set them not just a list of goals, but think of different aspects of your life and what you do. So, for example, personal and family, community, career, finance, mental well-being, physical well-being, getting your work-life balance right. And if you want to work out your goals, there are two great workshops that you might want to do. The first one is ask yourself three questions and be honest with yourself. Maybe discuss it with your friend or your partner. If I know I'll have snuffed it in six months' time, what would I want to achieve? What would I do if I win a million quid? And what dream would I follow if I was guaranteed to succeed? These are very powerful questions just to work out really, really, really what you want with what you've got. And the other one is to begin with the end in mind. You imagine your own funeral. So there you are, stone cold in a box, but you can still see a member of your family, a friend, someone from work and someone from your community. And you just imagine what will they say about me when it's all over and done with? That's a hugely powerful way of working out what you really want to do and your goals in life. And you then have to align your time with your goals because there's no point spending time if it doesn't fit what you want to do. But remember, if you say yes to something, you are saying yes or saying no to something else. There's only so much time. Although having said that, be careful not to say no to something. You can often regret not doing something you really wished you'd done if you just squeezed a bit more time or effort at it. Prioritizing is so important. And you should have a list. And when you make a list, you have a list of things to do yearly, weekly, and daily. And when you do the daily list, you have to refer to your yearly list as well. Because some of the big things you want to do this year, like write a book or something, get extremely fit, or spend more time with your family, you need to do daily little chunks in order to fill out your goals throughout that year or week. So at the back of your goal book, have what you can do this year and have what you can do this month or week and chunk stuff down. And when you organize your list and you do your list every single day, and I've got uh, my one just here, you don't just have a list of things to do, but you actually put the domains of each list down. So you'll have your personal goals for the day, family goals for the day, and so on. And then next to those, you can prioritize them. Things you must do, should do, nice to do, things you'll delegate, and actually things you'll cross out. And when you do that, it'll mean that the really important things that day, like your family stuff, you will prioritize over something that probably doesn't quite matter. Uh, so it's important to organize this list effectively. The next thing is to think about this matrix. Now, if you look at things, things can be not important or important, urgent and not urgent. And the problem is, is that we all spend too much time either doing non-important, non-urgent things, a real waste of time, or we're scurrying around doing important and necessary things. But the really important things in life are what's called quadrant two, which is top right. Things which are not urgent, but they're terribly important. So time with your friends, time with your family, getting fit, going to the gym, um, self-development, reading the journals. These are really important, but you'll never have time to do them because they're not urgent. So you need to learn to spend time doing stuff that's not urgent. Otherwise, you'll never do the important stuff in life. Chunking time. This is an analogy which works well. Rocks, pebbles, sand and water. If you try and get all the rocks, sand and pebbles into that glass, but you start with the sand, you will never ever get the rocks in. Now this, the middle picture 
is the same jar, the same stuff, but the rocks go in first. And this is such, I want you to remember this time management thing. You've got to put the rocks in first, else they'll never happen. The family events, the bike trips, the papers to write. And then you do the smaller things, then the pebbles, then finally the little scrubbly emails and phone calls. This is so important. And when you're looking at the rocks of your life, the things that take hours, but also very important, the quadrant two, try to remember to put them in your diary because these big blocks of time will just not happen otherwise. Actually put a block, it'll be Saturday evening or Sunday morning or a space that you've identified. So put these rocks into your diary. You're going on an aeroplane ride, you've got six hours, you can put in a big, big book chapter to write. So put the rocks in the diary and the other things fit around. Now, traveling time is another one. Driving is for fun. It's not for going to meetings. So you can do lots of things instead of driving around. You take a taxi, take a train. You can dictate, do paperwork, listen to an audio book, make some phone calls. All of these things are productive uh, and you get all these little jobs done rather than wasting time driving here and there. Now, organizing yourself the bag now in the old days you had a briefcase nowadays most of us just have this stuff all on your computer but the principles are the same and i'd love you just to remember if any slide you remember today there's two or three of them one was quadrant two this is the next one to really remember when you look at what you've got to do the thing is to recognize that things take different amounts of time and in your bag or in your, in your computer you've got things that will take five minutes a phone call 10 minutes a report to read 30 minutes maybe reviewing a journal an hour some report you need to dictate a four-hour job say a book chapter now in your day something will crop up where you get four hours free an operating list is cancelled or a clinic's cancelled or something in that four hours, never ever spend that four hours fiddling around with phone calls and reports and journal reviews, five minutes here, 10 minutes here. It feels great because every time you complete something, your brain gets a squirt of dopamine and it feels fantastic. And if you fill that four hours with lots of little jobs, your brain will be dripping dopamine by the end of it, but you will never in your life achieve those four hour things those rocks equally if you suddenly find you've got 30 minutes at lunchtime spare don't start a four-hour project and don't waste around doing a bunch of emails scurry around in your bag and find a 30-minute job and do a 30-minute job this is one of the keys to time management procrastination now there's good procrastination and there's bad procrastination. A good procrastination is putting something off so you can do a more important task. So what I showed you earlier about your little uh, book of things to do and you've prioritized things, you may well find that something comes along suddenly that's more important. Your daughter phones up and she's not feeling well. Suddenly that comes way to the top of your priorities and you will have to procrastinate something else. That's absolutely fine. There are other things that you procrastinate because they're not really that urgent and they're not really that important. And as time goes by, in fact, you just delegate them or you dump them. So there's good procrastination, but there's also bad, bad procrastination. If you delay something that's really got to be done, that's bad. You know, you lose opportunities. People invite you to give a lecture. Your mates ask you to go out with them. You don't respond and so on. And if you don't do it, you lose opportunities. You know, it's very, we know it's stressful to procrastinate. There's that job or jobs, you've got to do them and you just don't get around to doing them. And it chews away at you until you get them done. And there's also reputational risk. If someone asks you to do something, you say, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. And you don't do it. That's not good for your own reputation not good for the reputation of the organization for which you work. So there's good and there's bad procrastination. Now here's another one. I told you there's some real gems and here's another one. And this is eat the frog for breakfast. And it was Mark Twain who said, if you eat a live frog every morning, nothing worse will happen to you for the rest of your day. 
And this is a great time management thing because you know we've always got these things you have to do. You have to write a letter you do not want to write. You have to pay a big gas bill. Uh, you have to respond to a complaint at work or something, something horrible. And you don't do it, you don't do it, you don't do it, you procrastinate and it feels horrid. And it stresses you until you get it done. So if you eat that frog for breakfast, so first thing you do is get that vile job out of the way, you're going to feel great. And for the rest of the day, nothing could get worse. So eat the frog for breakfast. And if you subscribe to that, and it is a great trick, there's a book by Brian Tracy called Eat That Frog. And again, I suggest you get that book, preferably on Audible, because you can then listen to it while you're queuing for a bus. But this is a great book, Eat That Frog. Now, managing paperwork is another thing. You get buried. And here's a hint for you, which is to try and go through your in-tray once only. And as you go through this big pile of stuff, try in your mind to, to emphasize or to discipline yourself. Do delegate, defer, delete. As you go through it pretty quickly and ruthlessly, do delegate, defer, delete. And as you go through your paperwork, have a, a, an in-tray thing next to you. Anything that's rubbish, stick it in the bin that's next to you and then put it into different piles. So as you go through it, pile up the dictations and the phone calls and the filing away or stuff your secretary in different piles. And that means that at another moment, you can sit down in a 20 minute moment and do all your telephone calls or half an hour and do all of your dictations. And another tray is the manana tray, which is useful. The manana tray is, you know, you get stuff coming through which you can't deal with at the moment, but it's pretty important. It could be something like a fantastic holiday brochure you don't want to chuck it away. There's no way you can deal with it, but you just want to have it around for a rainy day. And the manana tray is a good thing to have to put those things that come through that you don't want to lose, but you just haven't got time to deal with at the moment. Dictation, quite a good idea to do it all at one time, pile it up and do it all in one time. I don't bother reading or signing my letters. I trust my secretary to get it right. And uh, they go off dictated, but not signed. It saves hours. John Farndon, who was professor of surgery at Bristol when I was a, a very junior doctor, he was a real hero of mine. And uh, he died early, unfortunately, but he was a fantastic bloke. And he had this thing. And when you get a bit of paper, rather than dictating or emailing, the, you can just have this stamp. I've still got it on my desk and you can stamp a bit of paper, write something by hand and stick it back in the post and off it goes again. Saves ages. Emails. Now, emails are like flies. They just bug you and buzz around you the whole day long. Uh, constant interruptions. Some of them are urgent. You can't deliver. Others are so trivial. You wish you'd never been born. Others have enormous attachments. You can't read. And you don't want to come home to this lot. So with emails, there's a few hints. But um, one of them is that you should color code them. And if you've got a Mac, and I'm sure other computers do the same thing, you can color code all the things in blue there, are diary things, and purple is checks to write out. Red is documents you have to review. Yellow are papers to deal with. But by doing this, you've suddenly created in your email tray what I told you about earlier, the rocks, pebbles, sand, and water. There's big jobs, there's five minute jobs, there's 10 hour jobs sitting on that email in tray. You can use that to fit your rocks and your pebbles into the jar. Another thing which I've learned too is I get positively neurotic if my email screen has more than a single page. I hate having emails spilling into hundreds and hundreds. So I do work quite hard to try and knock them all off. And finally, delegation. Now you can save a lot of time by delegating. Try not to do things in your productive time that someone else can do better than you or quicker than you or cheaper than you. Um, we're, none of us are good at everything. I'm pretty hopeless at most things, but it, it does help to spot people are better than you are and uh, engage with them uh, and delegate some things that you're not so good at. Um, I could never type letters quickly, but I have secretaries who are very, very good at that, for example. And when you delegate, it's quite important to spend and invest time to make sure you get the right thing done the exact task, when you want it doing, and the process you'll be using to make sure that it's coming back to you. And if you delegate and rely on delegation to save time or to get your workload through, 
then don't let that delegation be forgotten. And, and I have a system on my uh, computer where I have a separate file of emails. And if I email and there's a process that I've delegated or asked to get done, I copy that to myself and I have a little email file, which I look at each day. And it's just a copy of things I've got out there, which are delegating upon which my reputation rely or, or my peace of mind relies um, or my finance relies. And you can go back to that and just make sure that things that have been delegated actually happen because you don't want to get snagged up in someone else who's not eating that frog or someone else who's not putting those rocks uh, into the jar before they put the sand in. So that's it, really. Uh, I, I hope I've given you some ideas. I'm desperate not to run late. It'd be quite ironic if a time management talk overran. But don't waste time. Have a philosophy. Set your goals. Think about what they'll say at your funeral. Prioritise what you do. Chunk up your time. Don't waste travel time. Get organised. Good and bad procrastination. Paperwork. Emails are a nightmare, but you can deal with them. And delegation, don't use people, never use people, but delegate sensitively in a, in a cooperative spirit. So thank you very much. Uh, the virtual meeting this evening, uh, I'm sorry we couldn't deliver you a proper face-to-face -face meeting this year, but it was so important that we allowed the people doing all that research to get it out there. And a fantastic team has been developed. Uh, you can see the names there. We, Jonathan, Dean, Zaf, CY, Jeremy, Dominic, Sue, a great team behind us. Kavita, from the office, uh, Charlotte from the office, and now Emma from the office have been working tirelessly in the background. Uh, Kavita's put a huge amount of work into these two days. I hope you enjoy them. And we have two sponsors who very generously um, helped us with the prizes. So I do hope you enjoy tonight. I do hope it somehow replaces our meeting. And I look forward to seeing you all next year for real face to face again. Please all take care. Thank you. Hello, I'm Paul Sterling. Um, I'm here from Edinburgh and on behalf of my co-authors from Edinburgh and Fife, here to present our study, the aim of which was to determine if the outcome of surgery for Dupuytren's disease can be assessed by simply asking patients, how normal is your hand before and after surgery? In Dupuytren's disease, the perfect patient reported outcome measure is not felt to exist at present and the concept of self-perceived hand normality may be useful as it incorporates function, pain and appearance of the hand, which is not often included in currently available patient reported outcome measures. We collected pre-operative and one-year post-operative proms from patients and asked them how normal their hand was Re um, recording scores on a 100 point visual analog scale. We also collected the quick dash scores, EQ 5D scores and satisfaction on a 100 point visual analog scale. Results were available for 296 patients which represented a 77% follow up rate at a mean of 13 months. The majority of patients underwent open fasciectomy um, and then needle open fasciotomies formed 30% with derma fasciectomies in 17% of cases. We calculated and reported the effect size for the change in hand normality score using Cohen's D and undertook Spearman's correlation coefficient with the quick dash change and post-operative patient satisfaction. The median hand normality score improved from 50 pre-operatively to 86 post-operatively and this improvement was statistically significant. The median improvement observed was 20 points. Here are violin plots demonstrating the range and distribution of the hand normality score before and after surgery. A large effect size of 1.2 standard deviations was observed and we did not find any floor or ceiling effects. The change in hand normality score correlated significantly with the change in quick dash and post-operative patient satisfaction. In summary, we have introduced a concept of self-perceived hand normality before and after surgery for Dupuytren's disease the hand normality score improved following surgery and correlated well with pre-existing patient reported outcome measures. We feel this is useful because this is a single item score which represents a complex matrix including function, pain and aesthetics which is currently underrepresented in currently available PROMs. In addition, this is a patient perceived score and is not a patient's response to surgeon designed questionnaires and we therefore think that this score may be a useful adjunct for assessment of patients with Jupiter's disease in the future. 
we did have some limitations, a 23% loss to follow-up rate, although this compares favorably with currently available papers. And the lack of a gold standard problem in Jukotrin's disease makes it difficult to assess the validity of any new scores. Thank you very much, and I would welcome any questions. Hello. I have nothing to disclose. So the objectives of our study is to estimate the risk of serious local and systemic complications, as well as reoperation after the disease surgery. So we used uh, the hospital episode statistics or HIS database to include all other disease patients who required surgical treatment between April 2007 and March 2017. Um, so this is a longitudinal course study and a self-controlled case series analysis. So we included uh, around 121,500 adult patients who underwent um, 158,119 operations. So the cumulative incidence of serious local complication within 90 days was low at 1.2%. And for serious systemic complication, the incidence was around 0.8%. Um, so when we look at the amputation rate within 90 days, we found that the rate is particularly high um, especially for reoperation by limited fasciectomy after dam fasciectomy at 8%. And when we looked at operations routinely performed under general or regional anesthesia, such as limited fasciectomy or derma fasciectomy, we found that there is an increase of rate of systemic complications, um, especially AKI and MI. However, the uh, overall rate of systemic complication was low. So this is a kaplan meyer plot that shows that PNF had a higher reoperation rate. However, um, we found that dermofasciectomy and limited fasciectomy had similar um, reoperation rate in this data set. So this summarizes our main uh, finding. Overall, the systemic and local complications were low. However, our data suggests that um, certain uh, patients who are at risk of um, systemic complication should undergo treatment under local anesthesia. And we hope this data with informed shared decision making between uh, patients and uh, surgeons for this common treatment. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Rebecca Morrell. I'm one of the Hand TIG Fellows from up in the Northern Deanery. I'm here to talk to you about what patient reported outcome measures are available in the management of Jupiter's disease. The aims of this study were to test the reliability of PROMS in patients undergoing fasciectomies for Jupiter's disease. Our methods include a prospective case series. We collected outcome scores on 114 fasciectomies in 108 patients. We measured three different outcome scores, the EQ5D3L, the URAM scale, and the patient evaluation measure scale. We collected all scores on patients preoperatively, then subsequent scores gained at three, six, and 12 months postoperatively. The results were as follows. The URAM scores showed a clinically significant improvement, deemed as more than 2.9 points difference on the scale, in over 80% of patients by three months. This was found to be statistically significant with a p-value of 0.038. This improvement didn't reach statistical significance by 12 months, however. Patients that didn't improve by three months did not appear to achieve clinically significant changes in their scores later on by 12 months. The PEM score showed an average improvement of 22%. The EQ5D3L index score showed a more pronounced improvement from preoperative to three and 12 months postoperatively, but this again did not reach statistical significance. The EQ5D3L VAS score, the visual analog scale, improved from 85 to 87 at three months, but then dropped to 83 at 12 months. Statistical significance again was not reached. So in conclusion, we have one of the largest data sets of PROMs collected on patients with Jupiter's disease, showing that the URAM score is most sensitive to change at an early postoperative stage. The EQ5D3L does not appear to detect any changes in morbidity and should remain a screening tool for quality of life in patients with the disease, 
Perhaps this is related to the large number of questions focused on pain, which is not a classic presentation in this condition. The PEM score appears to correlate well, although the clinical significance of points of improvement on this score are not clear. Thank you very much for listening. Hello everyone, my name is Luke Gagan. Thank you for tuning in to our presentation entitled The Evidence of the Effects of Diaphysis Factors on Functional Outcome of Jupiter Disease Surgery is Limited and Flawed. We know that recurrence is not the only cause of poor outcome following intervention for Jupiter this systematic review aimed to identify all of the factors investigated for an association with the development, recurrence, progression and outcome of tube trauma disease and to appraise the quality of the studies investigating these associations. We conducted a PRISMA compliant PROSPERO registered systematic review of the published and grey literature. All studies that reported association between variables and disease development, recurrence or outcome were included. Distinction was made between univariable and multivariable analysis the latter of which can account for compounding by removing the influence of other factors. We included 51 studies which reported data related to 54,491 patients with tube trans. Studies reported association between outcomes and 46 diaphysis and non diaphysis factors. First looking at the diaphysis factors, the most frequently studied association was between family history and disease recurrence, as demonstrated by this core plot. Eight studies use multivariable analysis to investigate association between diaphysis factors and disease development or recurrence. Significant association was found between disease development and recurrence and family history, ectopic and bilateral disease. Three studies use multivariable analysis to investigate association between diaphysis factors and disease outcome, although no significant association was found. Of the non diaphysis factors, 11 studies use multivariable analysis and found significant association between the following factors and disease development, recurrence and progression. All associations demonstrated here are significant. Six studies used multivariable analysis and found significant association between the following non diaphysis factors and various disease outcome measures. Once again, all of the associations demonstrated here are significant. In terms of the quality of the included studies, all multivariable analysis studies investigating both diaphysis and non diaphysis factors had a moderate to high risk of bias as per the QUIPS tool. 70% had a high risk of bias due to selection bias and 62% had a high risk of bias due to confounding. So in summary, our work suggests that different factors are associated with the natural history and response to treatment in Jupiter disease. Traditional diaphysis factors may increase the risk of recurrence, but their presence may not be associated with poor outcome following intervention. The non diaphysis factors identified in this review may be associated with poor outcome following intervention. In terms of future work, defining a core outcome set will enable us to better define good and bad outcomes, after which association between candidate factors can be identified through scrutiny of national registries, such as the UK HAM registry. And once we've identified these factors, causal inference would then need to be established. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Lixi Shiren. I've just finished my third year as a medical student at Southampton University, where I carried out a research project with Professor Warwick. The title of this project was Dupatron's Disease, a patient-centred infography with Montgomery Proof Consent. Why is informed consent important when treating Dupatron's disease? The Montgomery Test and Professional Guidance ensures that patients should be actively involved in the decision-making process. In some situations, one treatment modality will be more beneficial to the patient, However, in many situations, it is the outcomes considered important to the patient which determine what treatment would be advantageous to the individual. Therefore, the process of providing all the relevant information to allow a patient to make an informed choice is fundamental in Dupuytren's disease. The first aim of our project was to develop a comprehensive infographic explaining the treatment options for Dupuytren's disease in concordance with legal and ethical principles. And the second aim was to provide the infographic in a freely available format. The review of case law and the literature based for Dupuytren disease in combination with clinical experience and higher reasoning were used to design a preliminary infographic. This preliminary infographic was peer reviewed for a focus group consisting of five doctors. Results from qualitative analysis using a categorization technique amended the preliminary infographic. The amended infographic was patient reviewed for a focus group consisting of five patients and then the results using the same qualitative analysis formed the final version of the infographic. The final version of the infographic consists of three pages. The first page clearly defines the alternative treatment options for Dupuytren disease, summarising the difference between percutaneous needle fasciotomy and the surgical modalities.
It is further expressed that if your disease is unproblematic, leaving the contractor untreated presents an option. Six key characteristics of treatment were identified through a literature review and subsequently through clinical experience and discussion in the focus group amended and finalised. A traffic light scheme has been implemented to ensure patients can identify for each characteristic of treatment which modality has the best outcome. The last page provides a framework for decision making with the clinic clinician's input to allow patients to evaluate all the options to them. Radiotherapy has been included on the last page of the treatment option to ensure all options are included. However, there were concerns that including it on the first two pages may mislead patients due to a specific role inv involving early nodular disease. In conclusion, case law and professional guidelines demand patient oriented information which can be provided with an infographic which can be a free, easily available handout to support the consent process. If anyone would like a copy of this infographic, please either contact either myself or Professor Warwick. Thank you for listening. Hi there everyone, my name's Alex Bolt. I'm one of the Hand, I'm one of the hand fellows in Oxford currently, and this is some work I performed in Oswestry with Simon Pickard on the anatomical variation of the motor branch of the median nerve to the thena muscles, a cadaveric study. So we want to look at the anatomy to the nerves that supply flex pulses brevis to determine if they are predictable and amenable to selective neurectomy to aid in the management of thumb and palm deformity in cerebral palsy. So we had 11 fresh frozen cadaver, hands and wrists. We looked at the age and the sex of the cadavers and the anatomy of each median nerve, including the motor branch. All cadavers were female, aged between 74 and 95 years. There were 10 extra ligamentous recurrent motor branches of the median nerve and one transligamentous recurrent motor branch. What we did identify is the recurrent motor branch actually entered the thena muscles before it divided them to the individual motor branches that supplied each individual thena muscle. This meant that the identification of individual nerves was actually very challenging and significant dissection of the thena musculature was required to identify each of the different nerves supplying the different muscles. Equally, the nerves weren't particularly consistent or predictable. We, we did identify, however, is there in eight of the cadavers there there were accessory branches were present within the proximal carpal tunnel these all originated from the radial side of the median nerve between 0.8 and 1.5 centimeters within the carpal tunnel they then exited transligamentously through the transverse carpal ligament and entered the thena musculature this is an example just to orientate you so this is a right hand this is distal proximal and you can see the median nerve here you can see recurrent motor branch and you can see the accessory branch here passing through the transverse carpal ligament. This is a left hand just to disorientate you. Distal here, proximal here, and you can see another accessory branch crossing the transverse carpal ligament on the radial side of the median nerve. And there was also a one case of a proximal uh, accessory branch that originated 1.1 centimeters proximal to the carpal tunnel but once again pierced the transverse carpal ligament and entered the thena musculature. So in conclusion, flex pulse brevis is not predictable enough to be amenable to selective neurectomy. Accessory branches in the carpal tunnel are perhaps more common than we think and these transligamentous radial branches may actually contain a motor component. What it does do is it gives further evidence to the importance of ulnar-based incisions to protect the innervation of the thena musculature and performing simple operations such as carpal tunnel decompression. Thank you very much for listening. This talk is about diffusion MRI for brachial plexus injuries. Traumatic injuries to the plexus are uncommon, but they're devastating for patients and costly for the health service. Surgeons are interested in identifying patients with root avulsion, or at least differentiating this injury from postganglionic injuries. That's because they're the most prevalent form of injury and they require early nerve transfer. So to facilitate early reconstructive surgery, early imaging is often done, but conventional MRI like this offers only modest diagnostic accuracy, which simply isn't good enough. And to qualify that statement, I refer you to our paper in radiology. That's why in Leeds, we've been experimenting with diffusion techniques for several years. Water in a vacuum diffuses randomly, isotropically. But the human body is not a vacuum. It's full of spaces, compartments, pipes and tubes. 
And this is particularly so, and particularly important, when it comes to nerves, where the diffusion of water is principally bidirectional. It goes up and down the nerve, staying within its respective compartments and rarely strays. And we can exploit this phenomenon using diffusion MRI. Here's a regular MRI of a nerve. It's an artistic impression. There's a branch coming off. If we resample this slice using diffusion sensitizing gradients many hundreds of times, then we can build up a 3D vector of the movement of water. That's called a tensor. Long, thin tensors imply water moving bidirectionally up and down the nerve, as we would expect. Spherical tensors imply isotropic diffusion, chaotic, as you might see in the connective tissue around a nerve. And we can join up highly anisotropic neighboring voxels using lines or tracts, and we specify a number of conditions to make sure the image doesn't get too chaotic. That allows you to build up 3D reconstructions of nervous tissues like this, which is a trapped ground with the spinal cord and brachial plexus in a healthy adult. And just remember that every pixel in this image contains detailed information about the 3D movement of water, i.e. its microstructure. We've shown that this technology is sensitive to chronic root avulsion, whether it's one, two, three roots, or indeed a panplexus avulsion. And if you'd like to read more about this, then you can check out our paper published open access in Frontiers in Surgery. We're testing this technology prospectively in adults with traumatic brachial plexus injuries in an NIHR funded cohort study in Leeds, supported by many, many people to whom I'm very, very grateful. If you'd like to know more or support the project, then please do get in touch anytime. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you for inviting us to present. My name is Rachel Marnie, an orthopedic registrar, and this work was done in Swansea Bay University Hospital Trust. We measured the outcome of cubital tunnel release in patients with normal nerve conduction studies, and there are no conflicts of interest to declare. The aim was to assess whether patients presenting with ulnar nerve compressive symptoms but normal nerve conduction studies benefit from cubital tunnel release surgery. This was a retrospective review of all cubital tunnel decompressions carried out between 2006 and 2019, and we selected those with a normal nerve conduction study preoperatively. These patients then underwent a telephone interview at a minimum of three months, and we assessed their modified Bishop score, a quick dash line score, and asked them to rate an annoyance factor, which was a rating out of 10, comparing symptoms pre and post-operatively, with 10 being most annoying. 396 patients underwent cubital tunnel release during this time frame, and of which 68 had normal nerve conduction studies preoperatively. Looking at the results of the modified Bishop scores, which is a post-operative PROM specific to ulnar nerve compression, assessing improvement in symptoms, residual symptoms, and level of function. 75% of patients scored excellent, with only 6% of patients scoring poor. The annoyance factor was improved in around 90% of patients, with only 3% of patients reporting that they felt their symptoms were more annoying postoperatively compared to preoperatively. 76% of patients scored less than 40 on the quick dash 9 score, which correlates with good or excellent results. However, three patients did score greater than 60. When looking at the patients that scored poorly, actually all patients reported an improvement in their annoyance factor postoperatively, and their modified Bishop score was 6.4 on average, which represents actually a good level of function. Looking at the three patients that scored greater than 60, they had all had previous cervical spine surgery. The limitations were that this was a retrospective review um, and we didn't do any preoperative scoring and obviously all the scoring is subjective. So to conclude, we feel that surgical decompression is a benefit where there is high clinical suspicion despite normal nerve conduction studies. We feel a normal nerve conduction study does not exclude pivotal tunnel syndrome and therefore abnormal nerve conduction studies should not be used as a criteria for surgical decompression. Thank you very much. Many thanks to the BSSH for the opportunity to present this work on NHS England's reported variations in the rates of carpal tunnel decompression surgery amongst clinical commissioning groups. The controversial evidence-based intervention programme that was laid out by NHS England in 2018 
tackled the provision of carpal tunnel decompression to rationalize commissioning and reduce unwarranted variability across the country in an effort to cost save. Their consultation document presented this cartogram showing the variation of rates of carpal tunnel decompression across the country, ranging from 5.9 to 141 per 100,000 population, an astonishing 24-fold difference. Strong rebuttals from senior clinicians and our hand society stated that belief that carpal tunnel surgery was not being performed unnecessarily, and that even the highest rates of surgery in the UK on this cartogram were substantially lower than other similar healthcare systems, and further analysis was required. The aim of this study was to do exactly this and investigate this reported variation. From the data presented by NHS England, we took the five CCGs with the lowest, the median and the highest rates of carpal tunnel surgery and sent them freedom of information requests, asking who their providers were for carpal tunnel surgery, as well as what, if any, guidelines for provision exist. In addition, we sent senior hand surgeons in their respective areas an online survey to further aid our investigation. From our investigation, we noted all CCGs had specific commissioning guidelines for carpal tunnel release. We also found that the commissioning of carpal tunnel surgery was complex and often services were purchased from a number of local providers. Most notably, we found a number of CCGs commissioned carpal tunnel surgery through community-based providers or through a community surgery scheme. In particular, four out of the five CCGs with the lowest rates of carpal tunnel decompression had a large proportion, if not all, of their standard carpal tunnels performed in the community. And in stark contrast, none of the five CCGs performing the highest number of carpal tunnels had provision in the community. We wondered whether this difference could account for the variation reported by NHS England. And indeed, on interrogation of NHS England's data collection, we found that they calculated surgery rates from secondary uses service data, SUS data, a data set set which does not routinely collect information from community or primary care services. As such, we concluded that accurate estimates of carpal tunnel decompression rates and any variation were not possible from this evidence-based intervention programs data set and the use of their finding to set target surgery rates for CCGs would therefore be flawed. Thank you for listening. So I'm going to get straight to it and kick off the questions. And uh, the first question is for Paul Sterling. Um, it's a question from Jonathan Hobby that he posed in the live Q&A, Paul. Um, he said your change in your hand normality score was only moderately correlated with the DASH, but we know that the DASH is pretty poor for measuring change in Jupiter's disease. So do you think your score is actually better than the DASH? Um, thanks very much, um, Jonathan. It's a very good question. The DASH score, we agree, is um, not particularly sensitive to change in Jupiterans, and actually the median change we observed was only an improvement in 2.3 points. So we expect it, that your question has arisen due to a limitation of the DASH rather than a limitation of the normal hand score. The DASH is the most commonly used uh, PROM for Jupiterans disease in the literature, so we felt it was relevant to include that. Um, but ultimately, the concept of a normal hand score improved greatly, statistically significantly, and, and showed promise when compared with other problems. So, so we think it is very much a useful adjunct for future analysis of patients with Jupiter's disease. Jonathan, you're on screen. Are you happy with that? Yes, I'm absolutely happy with it. it, it uh, I felt it was quite a tough question, but it's been very well answered. Hi, this is CY here. I'm the other chair. Uh, the next question will be directed well to, to Dom, my fellow co-chair, because the the presenter is away in uh, come come join us on this uh, uh, sessions. So Dom, I pick up a question from the live Q and A. Uh, this question from Laura, particularly about the high amputation rate. Uh, can you make some comments about the amputation rate? Yeah, I can. So this was, uh, when we looked, we, we found a pretty low 90 day amputation rate in primary Jupiter and surgery. But when we looked in secondary Jupiter and surgery, particularly when people were having further surgery after having had a dermofasciectomy, we found that the rate was much higher. So uh, with a limited fasciectomy after a dermofasciectomy, it was actually 8%. 
Now that's only uh, in, in a whole 10 years, it's only about 200 patients. So of those, about 16 of them ended up with an amputation. So these are things that as an individual surgeon, these are cases that you're not gonna see very often. And so, you know, maybe three, four in your career and you get away with all of them and no one gets an amputation and you give yourself a pat on the back and, and actually you're, you're a really great surgeon. But when you look nationally at the picture as to, as to what's really happening, you find that actually this is quite dangerous surgery uh, in terms of the survival of the finger. And I think this is really important information for patients to know, to know that there is that relatively high risk if you're doing uh, further surgery after a dermofasciectomy. Thanks, Don. Before we move on, I just want you to clarify one point. I, I saw that reoperation and recurrence were mentioned in the same slides. Uh, your study actually looked at reoperation rates, which is not identical to Correct. recurrence. Correct, because we're using national observational data, of course, we can't comment on whether there is a cord and recurrence of an angular deformity and that sort of thing. So you're absolutely right. We're looking at reoperation rates. Okay, thank you. Don, would you like to? Um, yeah, for sure. Like ask so, Rebecca next. The next question is for Rebecca, yes. So um, I noticed, Rebecca, that you basically had lack of significance on all of your scales at 12 months. Now, do you think that's because the patients were no better at 12 months than they were at baseline? Or do you think it's due to small sample size or is there another reason for it? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. So I think small sample size has to have an effect on that. And our response rate at 12 months had definitely dipped compared to the response rate at three months. So we don't have a comparable sample size for the 12 months response rate at that point. Um, I think in terms of what they are at 12 months, I think that's something that just going back to the previous question, the, the evidence of recurrence versus whether or not they're going to report that as being a change in their outcome score is going to be different at 12 months than, than where they are at, at three months, definitely. I think the hardest thing here is that what we did find was statistical significance, but not necessarily knowing whether that's of clinical significance, going back to the PEM score in particular. And because we don't know through literature what the clinically significant change is on the PEM score, then actually, although we may have reached statistical significance, it wasn't found to be clinically significant. And so to extrapolate that from three months to 12 months would not be um, appropriate to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Lou, next. So I noticed you have included many um, series. Do you think that there is a danger of bias in including those figures? Sure. So I think it's a good question. Um, and I think it's an inherent limitation of the Jupiter's literature. Um, when we're talking about bias, I think what we really need to look at is the dependent variables being studied within each of these cohort studies. Um, and sort of the robustness and probably the usefulness of the different outcome parameters may vary. So for example, true recurrence, which we defined as the development of new disease in the previous same site as surgery has been acknowledged at being a high risk of detection bias. And this is very well known. Um, and this sort of relates to the subjective binary nature of recurrence, especially with unblinded assessors with which most of these studies used. Um, if we look at what our review set out to do, it, we essentially look to see whether or not any of the traditional diastasis factors and indeed non diastasis factors are associated with disease development, recurrence, progression, and outcomes. And I think what our review has essentially highlighted is that the traditional diastasis factors may be associated with an increased risk of development, recurrence, and progression, although the non diastasis factors, which we've identified in this review, may be associated with poor outcomes following intervention rather than recurrence. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Mo moving on. Swiftly to Nick, a, a simple question hopefully for you, Nick. Have you tested this with patients in the clinic? Yes, that's a very good question. So we recruited five patients conceptually from the hand clinic and then carried out a focus group in the clinic at the, um, at a later date. The focus group addressed questions including whether the infographic was patient centered, did the patient have all the information they would require to make a decision? whether the infographic was clear and the layout was very easy to follow, and whether fundamentally the information provided was provided in an understandable manner and that it would actually help them to make a decision if they would be giving this information before their operation. Okay, thank right, you. Right, next, Alex. As you know, the FPB is often duly innervated by median and ulnar nerves. Did you explore the ulnar nerve? 
And do you think that's important? Uh, I do think it's important, and you're right, but it depends on which head, because superficial is more commonly dual innovated than deep. Um, we didn't. Ex- I, I looked at them, but I didn't explore them specifically because trying to identify the deep ulnar, the ulnar nerve as it comes around is quite challenging. Um, and it, we, in amongst the study, as you saw, the actual findings were slightly different to what we initially were trying to prove. And so, because we identified something that was actually what I thought was quite was more important with these radial sided branches, um, I didn't explore it routinely. No. Thank you. Well, I think we are. Moving on a bit, because I'm, I'm conscious that we have only a few minutes left. Ricky, uh, amazing images in, in your talk. I, I'm sure you'll be looking at some point to define sensitivity and specificity of your imaging technique. What's going to be your gold standard for that? Um, that's operative exploration for this particular study of the brachial plexus roots in adults subject to trauma. Yeah, so, being explored at surgery. Okay, so if you get uh, an MRI which shows no root avulsion, are you still going to be exploring them? Yeah, the patients recruited to the study are those who are forecast or expected to have an acute exploration. So they get scanned and then you get the grand truth looking in the neck uh, as to the status of the root, or at least as best we possibly can. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Rachel, I have a question from Christos um, regarding cubital tunnel. What criteria did you use for diagnosis? So this was a retrospective study. So the diagnosis criteria was based on what is our normal clinical practice at the moment, which would be a typical history um, describing ulnar ulnar symptoms um, and examination features. um, So using froments and tinel signs to replicate the symptoms. Um, We'd also ask people about any other causes, so about kind of neck pain or things like that that might identify a So there is potential variability in the diagnosis. And how about the nerve conduction standard of diagnosis? So that was all performed um, according to the national um, guidelines. So um, that uses sensory and motor testing of function um, using electrodes, um, all performed at one center. Um, so it's the same standard across all patients investigated. Thank you. Okay, final question. I don't think we've got all that much time. So last question to Abby. Um, you've shown that um, the, the rates in your study for uh, carpal tunnel decompression were wildly inaccurate. How would you calculate accurate ones across the UK? I mean, I think the simple thing that our study has shown that it the, the data collection wasn't robust enough to pick up all the providers that the the input carpal tunnels. Um, you know, there was a huge, huge number of community-based providers that, that the evidence-based intervention. And I think really the most robust way to do it is to have accurate freedom of information information from all the CCGs to find out every each and every single individual provider that there is for carpal tunnel provision in the country and and, and get their data accurately. It was a, a huge number missed by the, the consultation document. Or perhaps use some primary care data sets as well. That might give us a more accurate figure. Jonathan, you want to make Jonathan. a comment? Not long left. Uh, just to say that um, it might, you, you could, a cynic might say it's deliberately misleading. It wouldn't be the first time that government bodies had misquoted research evidence to support uh, rationing. Correct. Quite. Uh, well, I, I think I've done fantastically well. Uh, we have 20 seconds left. So well, I think we, we should just thank all of the speakers for putting, putting their talks together and uh, we'll see you in the next session.
members of the BSSH. My name is Niall Hindman, Managing Director of Acumed in the UK. It's a privilege to be able to support the BSSH meeting this year and provide an educational prize. But first, I would like to thank you all for your hard work, dedication and the sacrifices made during the COVID-19 outbreak. It is truly appreciated by myself, all of the Acumed team and the orthopaedic industry at large. Education funding is currently very difficult for many companies due to the dramatic drop in revenue through 2020. But what I would like to highlight is Acumed has a global educational grant resource available for orthopaedic education, and this is open to all members of the BSSH. Please go to the Acumed website, acumed.net, then in the About section, you will find the grant application form, but also beside this, the Fellowship Grant application form. Please apply for any orthopaedic-based education funding you need, and this is irrelevant as your status as an Acumed customer or not. This resource is about education and best practice, not about selling implants. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact your local Acumed representative or contact me directly. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Good evening, I'm Deepak Samson and I'm the Hand and Wrist Fellow at the University Hospital Coventry in Warwickshire. I'll be talking to you today about the viability of a post-operative virtual follow-up for carpal tunnel surgery. We set out to determine patient preference and opinion about virtual follow-ups before implementing a change. We used an anonymized, internally approved questionnaire, which was administered to the patients at the routine four-week face-to-face follow-up, which is our current practice. 45 patients were included in our study. Most of the patients included felt a virtual follow-up would have prevented them from rearranging their schedules taking time off work, saved them travel costs, and been more efficient. In spite of these perceived advantages, surprisingly, there seemed to be a tendency to prefer face-to-face follow-up. The reasons for this became clearer when we analyzed their comments in the free text space of the questionnaire. The concerns raised by the patients centered around three main issues. Language problems, when English wasn't their first language, access to a telephone, and potential wound problems. This was very useful as it helped us identify potential patient concerns and think of ways to address them. In conclusion, virtual follow-ups for carpal tunnel surgery have the potential to streamline flow through the hospital and be cost-effective for both the patient and the institution. Having said that, to make them safe and efficient, we must identify the cohort of patients who won't do so well with a virtual follow-up and will need a face-to-face appointment. This means identifying those with language concerns or technical issues preoperatively and patients with wound problems postoperatively especially in the current new normal scenario where virtual clinics are fast becoming the order of the day, our study was a useful pilot to identify possible patient concerns with virtual clinics and make them safer and more patient friendly. Our findings could also be extrapolated to virtual follow-ups for other minor hand surgery procedures. Thank you. Hi. This is CY from Wrightington Hospital. I'm grateful to the patient for his consent to share his story. He was a professional supervised motor racer who unfortunately crashed during a race. He sustained multi-systemic injuries to his neck, chest and limbs. He somehow survived the injuries and came back to the country, presented to me four months later with essentially a lower root brachial plexus palsy. As you can see, he had maintained control of his shoulder, elbow, but he did not have any active flexion, extension of his fingers or thumb. Neither did he have any intrinsic muscle functions. I thus planned two motor nerve transfers to restore his grip and release. For the first nerve transfer, The brachial radialis branch was exposed and stimulated to confirm its integrity. The recipient AIN nerve was exposed. 
Nothing on the media nerve blocker. AIN, nothing. For the second nerve transfer, the supinate branch okay, was stimulated. So and the PIN was stimulated to confirm no response. Neurography was then completed under microscope with nioethylon and fibrin glue. The patient specifically requested for restoration of sensation if at all possible. A novel nerve transfer was designed. The superficial ulnar branch and the dorsal ulnar cutaneous branch were dissected out, which served as the recipients. The superficial radial nerve was then transferred end-to-end -to, -end to the recipient nerve branches. Two years later, he had regained protective sensation of his ulnar digits and border of the hand. He had also regained active flexion of his thumb and fingers apart from the little finger. He had regained extension of the digits. In order to improve his grip, an FDP site-to-site -site tenodesis was performed under Wallant, the true benefit of which lies in the ability to judge the tension. In order to place the thumb in an opposable position, thumb CMCJ fusion and first web deepening were performed. Four years after injury, he had regained functional use of his left hand. He's now able to grip. To release and to pinch with his left hand. Thank you for your attention. Hi, my name is Matt Thomas. I'm one of the SHOs at the National Spinal Injury Centre in Aylesbury. For the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking about peripheral nerve decompression in the upper limbs of spinal cord injury patients. We were motivated to do this case series for two reasons. Firstly, nerve entrapment syndromes such as carpal tunnel and cubital tunnel syndrome are more common in SCI patients. Secondly, because SCI patients are heavily dependent on their upper limbs for activities of daily living, these syndromes are particularly disabling. Despite this significant burden of morbidity, there is a paucity of literature on outcomes following peripheral nerve decompression in these patients. We carried out a retrospective case series of 34 peripheral nerve decompressions in 24 SCI patients in the last five years. You can see here a snapshot of the procedures and patients that were included. So 24 carpal tunnel uh, decompressions, 10 cubital tunnel decompressions, uh, and these were performed in 14 tetraplegic patients and 20 paraplegic patients. The mean age of these patients was 53, uh, and you can see that the majority of these procedures were performed open and under a local anaesthetic. The outcomes measured included patient satisfaction, length of stay, complication rate, Boston carpal tunnel and prune scores, and nerve conduction studies. In the interest of time, I'm going to talk about three of the main themes that we found with our results. Firstly, SCI patients tend to present with atypical symptoms and with severe upper limb nerve entrapment. This is most clearly evidenced by the nerve conduction studies. Of the 34 procedures, we had 24 preoperative nerve conduction studies. You can see here that over 70% of these were graded as severe. The mean Boston carpal tunnel and prune scores preoperatively for these patients were also well into the severe category. The second observation we made was that these patients have prolonged inpatient stays. Generally, carpal tunnel and cubital tunnel decompressions at our centre would be day cases in, in non-SCI patients. However, the median length of stay for these patients was 14 nights. Despite this, these procedures were generally well tolerated and the complication rates were low. The final observation that we made was that patient satisfaction was extremely high. At clinic follow-up, 91% of patients were satisfied with their procedures. The improvements in symptoms and function of the upper limb were profound. You can see here the mean prune and Boston carpal tunnel scores pre versus post-operatively, and there's a marked reduction in both of these scores. So to sum up, patients with spinal cord injury have severe upper limb nerve entrapment at the time of presentation. Despite the prolonged inpatient stays for these patients, these procedures are generally very well tolerated uh, and are safe in a specialist centre. These procedures can result in a massive improvement in symptoms and function and in quality of life for these patients. This talk is about why hand surgeons should use alcoholic chlorhexidine gluconate skin prep. It's a very important topic because 
around the world, 10 million people undergo clean operations every year. And infection is the most common and costly complication. Whilst numerous bodies and guidelines do advocate chlorhexidine gluconate skin prep, there's a gap in the evidence with regards to clean surgery. That's the majority of hand surgery. And this is principally due to the limitations of conventional pairwise meta-analysis, where you bundle up disparate treatments in order to compare them. This can be perfectly resolved by network meta-analysis, and it's why we've readdressed the topic. Our systematic review found 17 studies of nearly 15,000 patients who underwent clean surgeries. The primary outcome was infection. This is the network plot which shows that the majority of patients were exposed to alcoholic chlorhexidine gluconate 2 to 3 percent. A sizable minority were cleaned with povidone iodine whether in water or alcoholic solvents, whilst the remainder received chlorhexidine gluconate of other concentrations in alcohol. We present the results of our network meta analysis in a league table. This shows all the possible combinations. The best treatment is in the top left, the worst is in the bottom right. For now, ignore the top triangle and zone in on this particular comparison, aqueous povidonidine versus alcoholic chlorhexidine gluconate. If hand surgeons switched from aqueous povidonidine to alcoholic chlorhexidine gluconate, then the risk of infection on average in their patients would be halved at very best, the risk reduction may be very much more substantial, or in the worst case scenario, alcoholic chlorhexidine gluconate may be no different to povidone iodine. This is a very important reduction because it appears to be for free because we observed no ignition fires. There were no reported burns, either from pooling or under tourniquets. And the only events of contact dermatitis were reported in patients exposed to povidone iodine. This is very important information for hand surgeons because you do more than 200,000 operations every year. Come what may, about 3% of your patients will get an infection. And every infection costs the NHS more than £385 per person. So by switching from povidone iodine to alcoholic chlorhexidine gluconate, we could prevent more than 3,000 infections every year and save the NHS more than £1.2 million. Thanks so much for listening. Good evening. My name is Matthew Cham. I am a trauma and orthopedics registrar from Seven. Thank you for letting me present my study comparing consenting clinics versus consent on the day of operation in elective hand surgery. The BOA advised consent to be a process and best practice is to obtain written consent in a dedicated consenting clinic. However, these clinics are not always possible, often due to logistical constraints placed on busy NHS hospitals. The aims of this study are to compare patient satisfaction and risk recall of written consent completed on the day of operation versus a pre-operative consenting clinic. All patients undergoing elective trigger finger release and carpal tunnel decompression were included in the study. Written consent was completed in either a dedicated consenting clinic or on the day of operation. The consents were done by two senior specialist hand surgery consultants and their registrar. A patient satisfaction questionnaire and risk recall was assessed at routine two to three week follow-up. 95 patients were reviewed and one patient excluded as they required an interpreter. Carpal tunnel decompression were the most common in both groups. The consent on the day of operation group had a slightly longer average time of qu to questionnaire of roughly four days, and the average time between consent and operation in the consenting clinic group was 57 days. Over 90% of consents were performed by the lead consultants in both groups with little crossover. Patient satisfaction was excellent in both groups. Every patient was satisfied with their consent and answered positively to all of our questions. The consenting clinic group had statistically improved risk recall of both pain and infection. In addition, although risk recall was poor between both groups, statistical analysis with the Mann-Whitney U test produced a p-value of 0.048 in favor of the consenting clinic group. Although the consent recall in our study is poor, the findings are consistent with the literature. 
This suggests that recall of consent is generally poor no matter how it is taken. Nevertheless, our study does highlight that the use of a consenting clinic does improve consent call recall, although this improvement may only be minimal. This raises the question of if consent recall is a useful marker of the quality of consent. The con consent is a multifactorial process, and although the findings of this study are positive towards consenting clinics, it is difficult to draw definitive conclusions based on consent recall alone. However, we do feel that clearly consenting clinics provide extra time for clinicians to discuss the consent, and so logically is the safest and best option as per the BOA advice. The increased time constraints placed on NHS services following the COVID-19 pandemic will, however, make consenting clinics more difficult. It may be useful to explore virtual or non-face-to-face -face options in the future. Thank you for your time. Good evening. On behalf of myself, Rebecca Morgan, and Kalpesh Vigela, I would like to present the publication rates of abstracts from the biannual scientific meetings at the BSSH between 2011 and 2015. Oral and post presentations at conferences stimulate debate between experts in the surgical community, influencing clinical decision making and guiding future research. However, peer reviewed publication remains the ultimate aim for most research, being robustly indexed and permanently retrievable. Our American counterparts have previously investigated their conversion rates between presentation and publication, but to date no British equivalent has been undertaken. We carried out a PubMed and Google Scholar search to find the publications from BSSH abstracts. We excluded those with significant variations between abstract and publication, as per Van Dyer methodology. Between 2011 and 2015, 456 oral and 328 posters were presented. 249 of these went on to publication, resulting in an overall publication rate of 31.7%. Oral, pres oral presentations were statistically more likely to go on to publication than posters, with a p-value of 0 0.0047. 80% of those successfully going on to publication reached print within three years. There was no difference between poster and oral presentations. Few were published after four years of conference display, as demonstrated by the Kaplan-Meier survival curves. Unsurprisingly, the conferences with longer follow-up, as in 2011, captured more late publications. So 2011 had 11 publications after three years, compared to 2015, that only had three. This impacted the average time for publication, declining from 20.5 to 15 months. 27 publications arose prior to conference presentation, with 19 in the preceding six months. Comparing to our American counterparts, with conferences specific to the upper limb in hand, our conversion rates are slightly lower, However, ABSERG in 2014 had a 10 year follow up which boosted their late publication rates, and Gavaza and Thiemann did not include the post presentations, which tends to reduce overall publication rate. We seem to be more similar publication rates with our British counterparts. In conclusion, both conference presentation and publication enhance scientific knowledge. Significant benefit can be gained from presentations, providing an opportunity for constructive criticism, allowing revision and augmentation of research. The publication rate from oral and poster presentations at BSSH between 2011 and 2015 was 31.7%, with oral presentations more likely to make it to full publication, consistent with other research. Many thanks. Goodbye. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this virtual meeting. Uh, I'm Mira, and I'll be presenting a study on pain and patient-reported symptoms associated with normal wound healing and hand surgery. Nearly half of patients undergoing outpatient hand surgery report moderate to severe pain post-op. And although pain associated with uh, operative wounds is an expected symptom, the degree of pain and the amount of time that the pain lasts can vary considerably between patients. And to date, there's no reliable data set to help inform patients of the sorts of normal pain to expect throughout recovery. So in this study, we explore the hypotheses that post-operative pain is affected by anatomical, surgical, and patient-related factors, and that pain diminishes with time in a predictable fashion. To do this, we asked patients in clinic to complete a questionnaire which recorded demographic information, as well as information about the operation and wound itself, such as the length of the wound and the location of the wound uh, with respect to the different sensory neural distribution zones of the hand. So for instance, 
uh, surgical repair of an FTP avulsion fracture would result in an incision, which we would mark there, and which would therefore uh, lie in the ulnar distribution zone. Finally, we would ask patients to report a current pain score by marking directly on the visual analog scale, and then ask for any other symptoms. A total of 78 uncomplicated elective hand patients were included. 52% um, were female, 88% were right-handed, and um, the mean age was 40 years. And you can see the ranges there as well. The mean length of the wound was 3.9 centimeters, and the mean time between the operation and the date of the questionnaire was about 24 days. Regression analysis revealed that wound-related pain did not return to normal until 44 and a half days post-op. Overall, a significant difference in mean pain scores was seen between genders, with female patients reporting higher pain scores than males. With regards to location of the wound, analysis of variance of pain scores for wounds in different uh, nerve sensory distribution zones was also significant. And we found that surgery in areas supplied by the ulnar nerve conferred significantly worse pain scores. Interestingly, though, the length of the wound did not have an effect on pain. So the main conclusions we drew from the study was that patients should be warned that pain associated with routine uncomplicated hand surgery can last up to the seventh post-operative week and that um, painful symptoms are experienced significantly more in the distribution of the ulnar nerve. Something that we didn't look at but which would be very interesting to see in future research is to explore the effect on comor of comorbidities on uh, wound healing and pain recovery. But we think that this study is an important step in helping surgeons better advise patients on post-operative management plans and recovery. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Sabrina Bhattacharya and today I'll be presenting on the outcomes of two-stage flexor digitorum profundus reconstruction. So quick background, the FDP tendon is responsible for flexion of the DIPJ and rupture of this tendon is commonly a result of trauma. The reason secondary repair is often performed is due to delayed presentation, failure of primary repair, infection or tendon loss. There are a few main techniques used for this. Firstly, the panovo holovich technique where the FDS tendon is used as a pedicle graft in two stages as shown in the diagram. In the Hunt technique, the first stage involves a silicone rod which is used to create a pulley system and in the second stage there is free tendon grafting. Kresler technique uses a combination of these two methods. So the aim was to determine outcome in these patients. This was a retrospective study um, completed at our tertiary centre, which is also a major trauma centre and teaching hospital. Data was collected over five years and all these patients identified from a database. Total number of patients who qualified were 24 and we used a combination of paper notes, op notes, and data from physiotherapy team and clinic letters to determine outcome. The main demographics was men aged in their 30s and predominantly injury to the dominant hand. And the main mechanisms of injuries we found were knife injuries, chainsaw injuries, and rugby injuries, and occupations as shown, manual labor, students, and chefs. So in our cohort, two thirds of the patients had a delayed presentation, and the main operative method was used was Hunter's technique. And in general, the time from injury to the first stage was 13.6 months, but had a huge variation from zero to 90 months. And the time from the first stage to the second stage, again, varied greatly from three to 61 months with a mean of 9.4 months. The main tendon used in tendon grafting was the palmaris longus, as shown in this chart. The outcomes are shown here. 12 out of 24 patients had a good outcome. Notably, five out of 24 had a poor outcome. So our conclusion is that the majority had an excellent or good outcome, which is comparable with the data in the literature. The most common complication being development of flexion contractures. Five out of six of these patients had subsequent tenolysis, and one unfortunately had a rate amputation as a result of predominantly infection. Our main limitation was incomplete data and failure to find all the physiotherapy notes. And we hope to amalgamate this in the future to provide more accurate data. Thank you very much. So first up for Deepak uh, about your carpal tunnel follow-up study. Yeah. Um, you, you recruited at the face-to-face follow-up clinic. Yes. yes. So 
do you not have an immediate selection bias? Because obviously the people who bother to turn up to face-to-face follow-up clinic value it more than the people who DNA it. So we, 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 automatically you do not have the people who, you, you said that people valued face-to-face follow-up, but that's because you had the people who bothered to turn up to it rather than DNA it. Is that not right? Yes. So basically this was a sort of a patient preference pilot before we went ahead with virtual follow-ups because our, our existing practice is face-to-face follow-ups. Uh, we didn't have another forum to admin, uh, administer the questionnaire in, but it did, it did prove vital in the sense that not only did it tell us what the potential problems with moving to a follow-up would be, uh, which is what we're thinking of doing, uh, it, it, it also told us uh, what, 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 uh, what would be beneficial for both the patient and the unit. And it proved especially useful when COVID struck because then we were thrown into the deep end of the pool and everything went virtual and it helped us uh, improve our patient leaflets. We put, it, put new videos on our web link. Uh, we also made patient initiated follow-up cards actually, uh, which we give out now. And now most of our follow-ups are either virtual or completely patient initiated. That's great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, hello, I'm Sue Fully Love. Um, I've got a question for uh, Mr. Ung. Uh, see why that was clearly an amazing success story uh, but on average uh, for each nerve transfer you do what's the chance of successful and useful reinnovation without significant pain uh, that's a big question Sue I think um, because even within nerve transfers some are more likely to succeed than others I do not have the figures of all the nerve transfer that I've done in terms of the percentage but certainly pain uh, that has been asked as well. I think sensory nerve transfer, someone will be concerned about using superficial radial nerve in this case in particular. But I, I believe that if there's something for the nerve to do, then there is less likely for painful neuroma formation. And maybe I got lucky with this case, but he certainly does not have issue with pain. Thank you. Um, Matt, a uh, very interesting study on spinal cord injury. And I found it very interesting that um, the patients uh, with spinal cord injury seem to present with more severe compression neuropathies than average. Um, I wonder if you have an explanation for that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's two things here. Firstly, is the the reason that spinal cord injury patients are more prone to uh, peripheral nerve compressions is is probably because their overuse of their hands and their dependence on their upper limbs. And that probably contributes. I think also delayed diagnosis is a big factor here. Um, so there's some overlap between their neurological deficits from their uh, peripheral nerve entrapments and their spinal cord injury, uh, which means that it's often not picked up. Thank you. Okay, and uh, I think we're on to Ricky. So Ricky, there's some questions in the chat from Thomas Takuna saying, would all hand surgeons use alcoholic prep? Uh, on open wounds and, and I think this relates really to something about uh, transitivity of your network is this actually does do you, are you sure that this network is robust in terms of its transitivity or are you actually comparing apples and pears here yeah so transitivity is is an assumption where you assume that everyone is equally eligible for the treatment in your network I you imagine it as a gigantic randomized trial and yet there's certainly equipoise amongst hand surgeons and our, our cipher survey showed that it's literally a 50-50 split in the UK for people who answered. Half of you are using Clortex, half of you are using povidone and iodine with various different solvents. So yes, theoretically, transitivity is assumptions are met. All the um, confounders and effect modifiers were balanced. So yeah, the network is mathematically, statistically robust and could be generalized to hand surgery, even though there's no sure hand surgery data in the network okay and we do have one other question that came from uh, uh, you know, Kavita was uh, uh, Krishma was a bit concerned about the uh, ethics of randomizing when there was such a large effect and you're very carefully pruned single pairwise results though I do wonder about the degree of uncertainty that was still there and also is the alcoholic alcoholic and the aqueous aqueous are they not the comparisons that we really need to be looking at so there's two questions there. The first one was about effect size and how lots of people like to zone in on the fact that their confidence interval crosses the line of no effect. Now, there's, all, there's been loads of sim work on network meta-analysis that shows what we should all understand about statistical significance, p-values, and stuff like that is just not valid in network meta-analysis because the main aim is ranking treatments. 
So it really doesn't matter if the effect size crosses the line of no effect a bit. If it's gigantically better than the next best ranked treatment, it's better on average. So, so you know, statistically speaking, it's better. It doesn't really matter if it crosses the line of no effect. So that's uh, question one answered. And question two is about um, alcohol v water solvents. Well, yeah, um, is the, is that the question? The yeah, the alcoholic chlorhex versus the aqueous iodine, or or really is it alcoholic alcoholic iodine uh, aqueous aqueous? Great question. I, I don't know how else you can disentangle it other than with network techniques. So as more data is generated from more and more trials where there's less and less biases and so forth, then hopefully we'll be able to unpick that maybe later down the line. Honestly, not too sure. That's great. Thanks, thanks very much, Ricky. Uh, so on to um, Matthew Chan. Um, now I was wondering here, you've presented a couple of statistically significant results and drawn our attention to those. Um, are you concerned about multiple hypothesis testing and are, are those uh, dramatic sounding results really stable? I mean, we've just heard about concerns about statistical significance in general. Do you think that those actually are robust enough to support your conclusion? Um, no, I don't think that those statistical findings are particularly robust. I don't think our numbers would allow that. Um, but and I don't think there was a great deal of difference between particularly the risk recall and the both groups. I think overall it's poor regardless of whatever consenting method you use. Um, I think it's more practical what I think we found is that actually the likelihood is if you are able to have a written consent and have that discussion with your patient in front of you, you are able to build a relationship with them which will give you a better informed consent than if you were to go without. Um, that's my overall conclusion on it. Okay, and, and very briefly and for a brief answer, um, my understanding of the principle of capacity for consent is that they need to retain the information for long enough to make a decision. Yep. Um, but you assessed it three weeks later, is that correct? We did assess it two weeks later, um, or two to three weeks later, which was due to the routine follow-up that they would have, um, rather than immediately assessing it straight after the consent process. Um, most of the other papers that have looked at risk, risk recall have done a similar thing. Um, I think overall, does the retention of the actual specific risks necessarily mean that they've got informed consent? I'm not sure it does. I don't think it gives a great quality of marker of the consent itself. Mm -hmm. I think um, reality wise, most patients don't. And if you look at the literature, it's very poor throughout. You're looking around 20 to 40% of, of risk recall throughout all studies that have looked at this. Thank, um, you. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, Rebecca, um, do you think the problem here lies in just low quality presentations or is it publication bias in the journals and avoidance of publishing, publishing uh, unexciting results? Where is the problem? Is it with the presentations or with the publications? Well, I think that um, there is obviously a publication bias and positive outcomes uh, techniques that are well known are more likely to get published. But I don't think that that detracts from the benefit that you get from the presentation as such. I think that um, we should encourage all presentations because it allows us to focus our research for the future and it allows dissemination of these ideas. So um, I think that although not everything is going on to publication, that doesn't uh, detract from the value of the discussion of the presentation. Thank you. Um, Mira, um, you don't give any breakdown of the type of procedures that patients had in your paper. Do you think, for example, if a patient had a bony procedure rather than a soft tissue procedure like a carpal tunnel release, that that might affect their pain score and your results? Uh, yeah, that's uh, really, I was kind of expecting this question sort of, but um, the thing that we've had with that, so the way that we've, we've run the studies, we've had these, um, the questionnaires that we've put in, uh, the hand clinics, the orthopedic plastics hand clinics, but also mainly in the hand therapy, the hand therapy clinics, so the sessions that the therapists run. So we found that a lot of the operations that we've had were, there was a lot of kind of missing data on details of operations that some of the patients had. So we found that um, possibly because of the kind of uh, lack of knowledge potentially or uh, limitations in that from the therapist or whoever at the individual filling it in. So we've had to kind of go back to um, patient records. So that's something that we're kind of 
following up so so looking into next so we've had we've had to kind of focus on the anatomical aspect um but we're kind of moving into looking more more details about the operations and things that the patients are looking at so unfortunately okay. the data was a bit limited in that sense yeah um, okay yeah. Um, Thanks very I'm going to have to call this to a close because it's vitally important we don't miss the prize giving. So it's been fantastic to all meet up online. It's a great shame we couldn't meet in person. David had organised a fantastic programme, much of which will be delivered in future meetings over the next couple of years. The evening's papers have been of a very high standard with excellent presentations and I'd like to congratulate all the speakers. I would once again like to thank our industry uh, sponsors, uh, Medartis and Acumen, for supporting this programme. It's been a great personal privilege to lead the team for this, our first virtual paper event, and I'd like to thank the whole team for all their hard work. Kavita and Char Charlotte have worked tirelessly to deliver this seamlessly on a completely new platform. The panellists and host, Dean, Sue, Jeremy, Dom, Zaf and CY have done a great job. I'd particularly like uh, to thank Wee Lam, who's been beavering away in the background, unseen, and has really been integral to delivering this programme. So now, unfortunately, I don't have a drum roll, but we come to the prize giving, supported by Acumed, uh, who is sponsoring this evening's uh, prize. In second place, Close, but I'm afraid no cigar, is Avi Cardas for his excellent paper on rates of carpal tunnel release, which I have to say was a particular favourite of mine, but failed narrowly to win over the whole panel. And the winner for his outstanding uh, systematic review on skin prep in hand surgery is Ricky Wade. So many congratulations, Ricky. Thank you to all the speakers, uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed this evening.